you very much, Miroslav, for an excellent presentation, and and thanks to all of you for uh, for still uh, being alive after a long uh, day. And and I have a, a plea to you all, which is to to please stay awake now. Uh, I know I know it's it's been a long uh, day, but but today you will see the first uh, direct systematic evidence of profit shifting through transfer price manipulation in a developing country. Profit shifting is when you move reported profits without moving actual activity. All right, so say that you are the owner of a multinational group with a subsidiary in the Cayman Islands and one in South Africa, then you have a tax incentive to, to shift reported profits from South Africa to the Cayman Islands. Now, if you do that without moving any actual activity, then you're profit shifting, and this is illegal. Uh, but if you close down your factory in South Africa or, or close down the production and move the entire production to the Cayman Islands, then you will also see the profits moving to the Cayman Islands, but this will be the result of an actual activity movement. And this is not profit shifting. Okay, so this is, this is a, a bit of an important distinction. Uh, and this is, as you can imagine, also why it's, it's difficult to estimate this, right? Did we observe a movement of activity or did we observe an artificial movement of reported profits. Uh, so I just I just want to reiterate uh, why this 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 topic is is relevant and particularly relevant in a developing country setting. So as as most of you will know, the corporate tax revenue is is very important in a developing country setting. So when you look at the contribution of corporate taxes to total taxes in developing country. This is, this is 20% compared to 10% in developed countries. So, so as you can see, profit shifting, which erodes the, the corporate tax, that, that hurts twice as much in a developing country setting. So that in itself makes this topic very important. And what we are at the same time observing is we have this very rapid expansion of M&E, multinational activity, uh, in developing countries. We're seeing this expansion all over the world, but it's happening particularly fast in developing countries. So as relevant as this issue is today, it's only going to become even more relevant. And, and as the corporate tax is such an important part of uh, the developing country's economy, you can see that a lot is at stake. The final point is that there's this hypothesis, which is, which is widespread that uh, developing countries, they lack the proper institutions to monitor and regulate and follow the multinationals when, when, uh, when, when multinationals are not playing uh, by the rules. And, and you heard uh, Michael also commenting on, on this yesterday. Uh, so, so this is uh, uh, an assumption and a, hy a hypothesis which, which has now been, been uh, somewhat backed by the data. So, uh, so I myself uh, started uh, getting into this topic really uh, three years ago, and, and, and what I have seen in that time is this rapid expansion of research on this topic. Uh, so you have really seen the frontier of research on profit shifting in developing countries moving the last uh, two years. So uh, I think uh, the contribution today by Miroslav uh, is a is an important part here. We have Caroline Szymanski sitting here in, in, the, uh, in, uh, in the room, also uh, made a very good contribution on profit shifting in developing countries. I myself have written uh, two papers uh, with co-authors. And then uh, we also have uh, Michael Keen uh, sitting here. I actually hadn't even realized that, that Keen in this paper, I've read so much, was Michael Keen, of course. Uh, so, uh, so, so just to say, there's really a lot of things uh, happening, and all of these papers have been truly amazing in understanding now the overall size of the issue, ballpark estimates of, of the losses, and for example, we now have support of this notion that multinationals are indeed more aggressive profit shifters in developing countries. However, all of this research on, on the previous slide relies on this approach which, is, which has been framed the indirect evidence approach. And that is an approach where you essentially find patterns in profitability which are consistent with profit shifting. So that is the identification strategy. And, and to explain it, uh, you here have uh, two pictures of, of cookies. 
And uh, if you can imagine the cookies as, as profits, uh, as you can see, I'm trying to keep it interesting. Uh, you, can, you can see that, that firm A, they, they doesn't have a connection to, to tax havens, but they do have a lot of profits. Firm B, they do have a connection to a tax haven and they don't have any profit. And now looking from this picture, it seems as a reasonable assumption that the tax havens ate the cookies. Uh, and, and I completely agree with, the, with, with coming to this conclusion uh, from this picture, and that's also why I wrote two papers using this approach. Uh, but of course, there are some issues when you use this indirect evidence approach. Uh, one is, for example, are we modeling uh, the profitability correctly when we see that there's a lack of profitability? Are we sure that, that the scales uh, of return in, in FDI are are just constant, for example. Uh, are we observing actual movement of activity? It doesn't have to be capital. It could also be knowledge moving, uh, moving et cetera. Are we capturing some of this? But in general, when I, when I present my, my previous papers, what I often meet is just a dissatisfaction that we're, we're not observing the movement of the profits. We're just observing that they're gone. There are no more cookies. The profits are gone, but we didn't really see how they disappeared. Uh, so today, we're, we're going to try to combat that a bit by, by zooming in on what is known as direct evidence, uh, and, and in particular, direct evidence on transfer mispricing of, of goods. So, uh, so this, uh, this is done by using highly, highly detailed data at the transaction firm uh, level, uh, where we are then able, because it's goods, we're able to, to have prices, unit prices. So so goods, I can say that this book here, that's one book, and I can say what's the price of this, this book. And when you have prices, then you are able to compare the price on internal and external transactions. So this is what allows, uh, allows me, in this case, to, to almost directly observe transfer mispricing, uh, which is one form of, of profit shifting, and come with this really, really credible evidence. And, and I think the truly amazing thing here is that, as I said, a study like this was really not thought uh, possible uh, outside uh, OECD, and, and we only have these, these four countries, uh, Denmark being one of them, where I'm from, that has actually been able to produce a study like this. And of course, this is, this is only possible due to uh, the amazing work done by, by the UNU wider and the National Treasury in South Africa. Which, which made this tax administrative micro database that I can only highly recommend other people to start using. And I can say, coming from the, the country of, of tax administrative data, that, that, uh, that this database is really on par and, and, and top, <laughs> top of the line. Uh, so, so before we move forward, I think it's important uh, to say that, that what I'm going to present today is not uh, something that's gonna replace uh, this previous research I was uh, I was citing. Uh, instead, it's it's gonna be a complement, right? So what we're gonna do today is that we're gonna zoom in on a corner, and and even a small corner of of, uh, of profit shifting, and we're gonna find some really really credible evidence of this. Um, now, what um, Miroslav was showing was global evidence of profit shifting. So that is the ultimate scope, right? And I see, at least today, that we have this trade-off. So I have papers now in, in each of these boxes, and I think we need all the evidence in order to, to, to get a, a clear idea. But today, we're really, really now trying to get this, this very credible evidence, which can also uh, be applied in, in practice uh, using algorithms in tax authorities. So uh, as I promised, we're now going to zoom in on these transactions of the multinational firm. And to under understand transfer mispricing, you, you first have to understand that, of course, any multinational firms will engage in both internal and external transactions. So the internal transactions, I, that's the multinational trading with itself. That's why they exist to begin with. Uh, and the external transactions, that's when the multinational, for example, sells the final product uh, to a consumer, but it's also buying all in, uh, inputs that it's not itself uh, constructing, et cetera, et cetera. So by law, uh, there's an arm's length principle. Uh, and that is that when the, the multinational is, 
is buying uh, from itself, it has to close its eyes and, and imagine that it's not buying from itself, it's buying from an external party. Uh, so that is, that is the law and essentially all countries uh, where I have looked into the tax laws. And, um, and as you can see, uh, it's, it's actually quite a requirement that you're, you're, you're giving the multinational. Sometimes it's, it's, it's even hard, hard to imagine how, how you can even make this thought experiment. And, and of course, firms on top of this have really an incentive to deviate from their arm's length principle. Because when they're trading internally, there's a tax incentive to price uh, the, the, the products differently than they would have done when they were trading externally. So say, for example, that I'm now importing a, a book uh, from my subsidiary in the Cayman Islands. Well, if I could choose freely, I would like to price that at a million dollars because that would allow me to shift one million dollars from South Africa to the Cayman Islands. Uh, when I'm trading externally, I really don't want to pay a million dollars for that book because why would I do that? I want to, to buy the cheapest inputs as possible. And as you can see, that, that really it creates an incentive to have a wedge, uh, a tax wedge between these two uh, type of transactions. So, uh, so here I, I just put a, a fictional example of, of what we're, we're expecting. If you imagine a company only trading in bolts, buying them externally and internally, then we expect that the internal price will be really high compared to the external price when they're importing from low tax destinations. And this won't be the case when they're importing from high tax destinations. So now we come to the, to the data part where we really can exploit this, this amazing data set that has been created. And we can, uh, and we can calculate uh, the unit prices of imported goods in each transaction. When we have the, 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 the unit prices, we can then go to a regression model and estimate what we would think the transfer price uh, would be in each case. And so we can estimate the arm's length price. And when we have estimated the arm's length price, we can calculate the deviation for that in a regression framework. And we can see if we estimate, if the estimated deviation from the arm's length price correlates systematically with the incentive to deviate from the arm's length price. Uh, so this is really the, 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 the approach or the to-do list if, when you want to do this. And, and of course, it, it requires this, this very detailed uh, transaction level uh, data, which South Africa has created. Uh, so so uh, just looking at, at the descriptive data, just at a first glance, you can, you, can, you can almost see here that there's something going on, right? So here you see the average uh, unit price uh, uh, and, and how that, that in percentage deviates uh, from, from the, uh, from when you compare related to unrelated imports. So, so the red column shows you that in, in average, just looking at average uh, unit prices, we see an almost 60% higher unit price uh, on imports coming from a low tax partner uh, when they are related compared to unrelated, right? So, so when I'm buying uh, the book from, uh, from my subsidiary in the Cayman Islands, I'm pricing that 60% higher than when I'm buying a book from an unrelated party in the Cayman Islands. This is just an example, of course. Uh, however, when you look at the high tax partners, you actually see no difference. You see that related and unrelated uh, imports, they are priced the same way. Uh, of course, right now we're not exploiting any dimensions of the data because this is just average unit prices. We are literally comparing apples, oranges, bolts, and books. So next step is, is then to use these many, many dimensions of this amazing data. Uh, we even have eight digit product codes uh, which, which, uh, which is a bit of an abstract concept. What is, what, how detailed is an eight digit product code? Well, here is one of the categories, patches for puncture repair of self-vulcanizing rubber. So I have no idea uh, what this is, but I can see that it's very, very specific. Uh, and, and that is really uh, the, the amazing thing about this data and where it actually uh, supersedes what we have even in Denmark is that you have this amazing amount of detail uh, which really allows you to 
very accurately predict the unit prices. Uh, so when you have these, these, uh, these product categories, a natural next step would be to do the same analysis I did before, uh, but now within categories. So we saw that in average, that's the, the bottom part here, the, the all products line, we, see, we saw the 60%, right? <clears throat> Just average unit prices from no tax destinations seem to be overpriced by 60%. Now you can do that same analysis just within uh, a computer park or a specific uh, taps and cocks or the seal of rubber, that was the patches for uh, puncture repair. So you can do this, this, uh, this aggregate analysis I did just within each product category. Uh, and as you can see, in, in some way, the, the estimate actually uh, remains within the same ballpark. But you can dig even deeper than that. You can actually see the same firm importing the same product. Uh, so, so one concern when digging that deep is that, that maybe the firms will be aware that it looks a bit suspicious if they're actually importing uh, books at, at widely different prices. But even when you use these firm product uh, fixed effect, you still see that, that imports uh, from, from uh, low tax countries are uh, are overpriced when they are internal. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, so this is, in general, I, 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 I try to limit tables in, in these short presentations, but, but if you're interested, these, these are the results. I think the interesting part is here in the bottom where we, we actually find, or, or I find, that, that, that the responsiveness to, uh, to these tax incentives is actually not uh, significantly different from what have been seen in Denmark, France, etc. So, uh, so that is that is interesting. I, I so a word of caution is that, that these estimates are a bit all over the place, but at least we're not seeing uh, any dramatic differences compared to, for example, Denmark. So, so I think that is that is interesting. I I also think that that something like uh, transfer mispricing of goods is maybe why we would have expected less deviation than say set for example uh, with with royalties but uh, but again now we're getting some very concrete evidence on on what these differences are uh, between countries and and this is a tool that can actually be used in the flagging of, of firms yeah uh, so to conclude uh, we have we have managed to to now get this this very credible evidence of profit shifting in a developing countries. And, um, and a bit surprisingly, uh, so far, it doesn't seem that, that there are, it's an order of magnitude uh, different than, than what we observe uh, in, in uh, OECD countries. Uh, but, uh, but, but I would say that the work has only uh, begun. There are, there, are, there are so many, I was speaking with Elizabeth, there are so many things that would be nice to investigate further. And, and I can only, uh, if there are any listeners, uh, recommend that, that other uh, developing countries also start uh, uh, allowing researchers to use these databases because, as I said, you can, you can actually use this in the day-to-day -day work.